we've been attempting to understand the plasma, understand the the technologies, how this thing behaves, the engineering challenges going forward. And we haven't yet actually addressed necessarily, or at least fully, those steps towards going from a, a physics experiment to, you know, a, a delivering power source that could be put onto the grid. <laughs> What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? So you might have heard some of the recent excitement about the star in a jar technology that is nuclear fusion. The UK government and the European Investment Bank are pumping hundreds of millions of pounds or euros into fusion projects. And China, India, Russia, the United States, many privately backed companies are working on developing commercially viable fusion reactors. The world's biggest nuclear fusion project, ITER, I-T-E-R, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, located in southern, southern France and with a hefty price tag of £18.2 billion, has now entered its five-year construction phase. And this is a collaboration between China, the European Union, India, Japan, South Korea, Russia and the US. And it will aim to, de uh, to demonstrate whether fusion can be commercially viable. So I want to learn a little bit more about fusion, understand what's the state on the ground. So to help us to dig into this fascinating world of nuclear fusion and a hopeful, clean energy future, we welcome Anthony Shaw of the Joint European Taurus Fusion Experiment. Welcome to the show. Afternoon. Thank you very much for, for taking the time. So um, Anthony Shaw is a plasma spectroscopist which I thought particle physicist was a cool title, but that's, uh, I think we've had a higher bidder. So a plasma spectroscopist working at the Joint European Taurus or JET nuclear fusion reactor, the world's largest fusion device currently at Column Center for Fusion Energy as part of the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. And he's responsible for plasma di uh, diagnostics in order to better understand the behavior of the complicated fuel that goes into uh, one of these fusion reactors. So, uh, Anthony, just starting from the start, so for our viewers out there, what is fusion and how is it different from how we would usually work in a in a standard nuclear power plant? Okay, so, well, starting from the, from the important stuff then. Yeah. So, um, nuclear fusion is uh, basically the same process that sort of powers the sun. Yeah. Uh, and what it effectively is, is you start off with, with two... Um, very, very small uh, nuclei. So inside an atom, you've got electrons buzzing around a, a central nucleus, yep. which is made up of photons and neutrons. Um, and if you start with two quite small ones and smash them together, yep. uh, you can end up with a slightly larger nucleus at the end. Um, and if you're clever about which ones you choose, uh, you can get that reaction so that the stuff that you start with, the reactants, uh, actually weigh more than the stuff that you've got at the end, mm. the products. And so what you've done in that situation is you've actually converted some of that mass yeah. into energy. And so in in that respect, it's uh, similar to nuclear fission, which is current nuclear power, um, where you start with one very, very big nucleus and you split that in half. Um, and again, depending on which nuclei you start with, um, you can end up with your uh, products weighing less than your reactants. And again, you, you've generated energy in that way. So why would we want to go from the small to the to the to the larger rather than from the larger to the smaller, which is what we currently do? What's the what's the huge benefit there? So the, the main benefit really is just what you're dealing with. Yep. So with with current fission uh, technology, you're using something like uranium or plutonium yep. or possibly thorium, things like that. And when they split into smaller, uh, smaller nuclei, you end up with some pretty nasty materials, mm. some of which are still very heavily radioactive yeah. um, and can remain so for, for an awfully long time. The advantage that fusion has is that um, you can start the, the fuels that we use are isotopes of hydrogen. So they're really, really basic, really easy to get hold of in, in principle. 
um, and the product that you produce in in our case in particular um, is helium which actually if anything there's there's not really enough of uh, <laughs> there are some other scientists who would quite like a little bit more helium for cooling various things yeah, yeah. Um, don't think we'd be in the business of producing huge amounts of helium but uh, nevertheless it's, I'm, a, uh, I'm an LHC man or or I was so uh, I understand the need to lots of helium to cool down these uh, these superconducting electronics so it's always yeah, uh, it's it, always of use as a as a byproduct yeah it's also you know i mean as with with regular nuclear power you do end up with an awful lot of power coming out yeah. from a very small amount of of initial uh, material and so unlike in sort of standard chemical reactions anything where you're burning mm. oil or fuel or gas or something like that um, you can end up with an awful lot more power out than you would from, from something else like that. So the fuel has a has a very high sort of energy density, energy concentration. It certainly does, yeah. So why is um, why is creating fusion so difficult? Because it's it's one of those things where it always seems to be twenty years away. You know, regardless of whenever we're speaking. When I was talking about this twenty years ago, it was twenty years away, and now we're here, and it's still sort of twenty years off into the future. What is the what is what are the huge technical difficulties to overcome, and why is why is fusion such a a difficult thing to to get going and to get right? So yeah, so in in principle, the reason that that the reaction in itself is actually really hard to get going mm. um, is just that um, unlike in regular fission, you are trying to get two particles really really close mm. to each other that are both positively charged. Yeah. So you've got an awful lot of electrostatic repulsion that yeah. will. Yeah go away so you need to give those particles a huge amount of energy which translates to really really high temperatures yeah so uh, you mentioned the joint european torus that's the, the machine i tend to work on on a daily yeah. basis yeah. um the kinds of temperatures that we need to achieve in a device like that are about 200 million degrees <laughs> which is, it's about 10 times the core of the sun um in which, order to get i, these I think is what is what is what the uh which is what the climate protesters are predicting for like 10 years down the line, I think. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, yeah, it's a very, to, to, to stop joking, that's an incredibly, incredibly high temperature. It is indeed. And, and getting and sustaining those kinds of temperatures is inherently pretty tricky. Mm. Um, that's not to say that we don't do it. We do um, on a daily basis in, in the Joint European Taurus. We create fusion. Fusion actually happens every time we, we have an experiment. And um, you can actually get these things to happen. Um, the difficulty in, in a way, really, at this point is sort of scaling things up um, as you build these devices bigger and bigger um, as you need to to get the kinds of, you know, you need lots of fuel in there in order to actually get a decent amount of energy out. It's no good. You know, you can't really have a little Mr. Fusion device on top of your yeah. your car that's going to produce. We're, one we're, we're not quite at back to the future levels yet. We're talking about big big machines in warehouses and this kind of thing still yeah i mean when you've got uh when you've got material at that kind of temperature you need you can't have it in a really really small device yeah. because trying to confine that much energy in a really really small space is just really difficult yeah. um, we use really powerful magnets to keep everything contained yeah. um, but in principle that the whole sort of 20 years away thing um, it I think certainly at the start um, it's the kind of thing that was was said when the technology was sort of in its infancy yeah. and you say yeah, we'll, we'll sort out all the problems really quickly yeah. and yeah. Uh, there yeah. won't be any and we'll get there straight away and you know how much of that was um you know scientists on the ground actually saying that and how yeah. much of that was was yeah. a bit of uh, interest by the media at yeah. the time yeah. is, is up for debate um but it's the kind of thing that we've put a lot of of, uh, of work into over the last few decades and now with machines like ETA being built in the south of france which are nigh on the kind of size that you would need for a power plant yeah um we are getting pretty pretty close to these kinds of things um, and unless you sort of discover some brand new physics that comes up, you know, when, when you build these larger machines, we do have a, a pretty decent idea of how to control them and how to actually uh, build a big enough one to get some power out of it. Good. So we're making a lot of progress. And I guess just with alongside that sort of technical difficulty comes a great deal of expense. If we're talking about extremely high temperatures, we're talking about containment, we're talking about you know, huge amounts of infrastructure on the ground and just a, the footprint of the of the thing. These these are going to be expensive machines. I mean, I think the the ETA you talk about is, is sort of twenty billion pounds. I'm imagining Jet was 
you know, a, a similar amount or a release of the same order of magnitude in cost. So yeah. it's technically difficult and expensive, but the, the payoffs are potentially very, very, uh, very, very good. So so let's talk about some of those payoffs because you, you touched on them a little bit. So why has this now become such a hot button issue in the contemporary world? Why sh- Why should we care so much about the success and the development of commercially viable fusion technology? Why is it, why is it such a big deal? I mean, so the big deal about it is is really the uh the benefits that you can get out of a fusion as a power source yeah. so obviously with climate change um you know you want to be moving away from things that are producing large amounts of carbon dioxide um you know nuclear fission works very well as as what's referred to as, as a base load yeah. energy supply um you always need to have a sort of a fairly substantial robust amount of energy all through the day and night that you can rely on yeah um and things like wind and solar and tidal are really, really good source of it, sources of energy and certainly will be um, a big factor in the energy mix in the future. Um, but they are inherently the kind yeah. of thing that you need topping up occasionally. Yeah. You need to have something as a baseline. Um, as a thought, you know, that the idea of having huge batteries on the grid is something that yeah. I think is being thought about. Yeah. But battery technology being what it is, it's it's still tricky. Yeah. And the advantage fusion has is it's again it's something that we can control. Yeah. So you can you can turn your fusion reactor on and you know, if we design them like this, you turn it on, keep it running, and you just get energy out as a, at a constant rate. Yeah. Um, so it works very well as a sort of supply in that respect. Yeah. Um, but it's also got a number of advantages in terms of things like it's clean, so yeah. it's, it's producing you know just helium. Yeah. Uh, it's clean from a radioactivity point of view yeah. as well. Um, I mean, you you irradiate the machine that you make your fusion in. That is inevitable. You've got neutrons yeah. flying yeah. around, and it will make the machine itself um, irradiated. But you're not producing the same kind of standard waste that you do when you produce nuclear fission. Yeah. You're not producing these really horrible um, heavy metal radioactivity yeah. Um, as a matter of course, yeah. uh, they're the kind of thing that you, you get into your into your reactor. And the amount of time that they stay radioactive for in the kinds of simulations that we do um, are on the order of hundreds of years rather than tens of thousands of years. And that kind of storage is significantly easier as a thought. Um, the final thing that, that it has in terms of, uh, you know, against nuclear power, not that I want to say I'm against uh, nuclear fission. I do think it's a, a pretty decent yeah. thing to have as a, 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 a stopgap, at least, I guess. Yeah, at, at the very least. Yeah. Um, is that it's inherently safe. So we've talked about how hard it is to get this fusion reaction to happen. We've got these 200 million degrees. Yeah. And it might sound a bit, you know. It doesn't, sa- it doesn't sound safe. No, it doesn't. Until I tell you that we have in the Joint European Taurus, which is. It's about 100 cubic meters inside. That's like two shipping containers. Yeah. The amount of gas that fu- that would be fuel that we use to fill that machine is about a teaspoonful yeah. at room temperature pressure. Yeah. Um, and this is the thing is there's so little fuel actually yeah. in the machine um, that even if something goes completely wrong, it's a thousand tons of steel um, around the outside. So even though you've got it at 200 million degrees, your fuel, uh, you know, a few grams of the stuff isn't gonna isn't gonna phase the machine at all if you if you lose control of it. And that that's um, really important, isn't it? Because because nuclear fission, despite it being a very good source of energy and, and and potentially much cleaner than some of the alternatives we have, even though we produce these radioactive output, it really does seem to have a, a massive PR problem with you know things like Chernobyl, things like Fukushima. Despite the fact that more people have probably died from, you know, the the coal fumes from power plants than they ever have from a nuclear disaster, it it Mm. feels much worse to human beings have a perception that this is a dangerous technology. You know, you see the radiation sign and, you know, this is an incredibly dangerous thing. And if we could get over that with with fusion, that would be uh, that would be an incredibly sort of nice mental hurdle to jump over as well, I guess. You're definitely right. I mean, a PR problem is is certainly the way I would put it for yeah. nuclear fission. I mean, it is it is by far the the lowest number of deaths per mm. gigawatt hour of any electricity uh, that you can get. But you have you know large international incidents, yeah. and these are the kinds of things that paint on on the, the consciousness. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I mean, that being said, it doesn't, it's not helped by um, the occasional sort of uh, not super scientific responses of, <laughs> of, 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 of society. Um, we could, we could, we could, yeah. we could hammer on that all day. Believe me, that that <laughs> yeah, link, that link between science and, and the media looks, uh, yeah, which is uh, an interesting issue in itself. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 generally you know well reported and things, and it's 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 worth not glossing over those yeah. kinds of issues. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, it's it's something to 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 be thought about. Um, but yeah, the the reason for the safety is. Yeah, with a, with a nuclear fission plant, if you do have problems, it's the kind of thing where it stays hot for a long time. Yeah. It's still radioactive for a while. With a fusion reactor, as soon as you lose that temperature, no fusion reactions can continue to occur, yeah. and you end up with just a bunch of hydrogen gas in a yeah. You know, and I say a bunch. I mean, you know, a few grams of the stuff yeah. inside a you know two thousand ton state steel container. So it's not going anywhere. Yeah. It's, it's not a not a particularly uh, dangerous scenario so it, it does have that inherent safety to it i remember going to the uh to the start of the the lhc so the way it works is there's several smaller rings which accelerate the the protons before they go into the big ring and you can follow these all the way back through to the to the start quote unquote and i was like i really want to see where it starts where does the hydrogen come from it's going to be really interesting and of course you don't realize that all it is is a bottle on a wall a little bottle oh, yeah. of hydrogen like a liter bottle of hydrogen that just goes and then and then that's it i was like yeah. is that it i was expecting this like huge pumping in machine but you don't realize that obviously because atoms are so tiny it's just a few grams it's just a it's just a squirt into a huge machine um and it, it, it seemed really i got that i was just like really uh really sort of let down as a massive anticlimax. but but then i thought you know when you employ your physics brain you realize yeah of course that it was always going to be so so Excellent. So this is a clean technology in terms of radioactivity and uh, CO2, thinking about climate change, safer, mm. uh, abundant fuel source. If we're going to be using things like uh, do you use heavy water, is it? What, what is the What is the fuel that's uh, that's going? Yeah. In there? So I, I mentioned isotopes of hydrogen. So that's yeah, that's um, hydrogen is just a single proton. Mm. Um, isotopes having uh, an extra extra number of different neutrons yeah. inside there as well. Um, the most sort of energy efficient and easy to get going reaction that we can do um, that we found is something called a deuterium tritium reaction. Yeah. Uh, now, deuterium is proton uh, hydrogen with one extra neutron. So, yeah, that's heavy water is normally uh, normally deuterated water. Yeah. Um, and tritium is, is a, a proton with two extra neutrons. Um, it's worth mentioning. So deuterium is, is really, really common. About one in 6,000 parts of seawater is just happens to be heavy water. And, you know, you can buy bottles of deuterium gas off, you know, sensible scientific websites. <laughs> uh, I've always said that I think you can order them off Amazon. I don't know if that, I should probably search that to see if that's actually if true. If that exists, it's going to appear. Don't worry on the video. It's going to be cut. In, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see about that afterwards. As long as you know how to deal with gas bottles safely, because they yeah. are. Yes. And what about, what about the tritium there? That tritium is a little bit more tricky. So yeah. um, I don't, have you seen the second original Spider-Man, I say original, Spider-Man film with Tobey Maguire in it with Dr. Octopus? Yes, I have actually, yeah. Where right. it starts dragging the cars, the sun that starts yeah, dragging yeah, the cars. Yeah. So that, yeah. that is ostensibly a fusion reactor in that film. I'm not going to go into how badly it looks. <laughs> it's not terrible all the time, but... Yeah, quite a lot of it's pretty poor. Yeah. Um, don't worry, none of the uh, none of the like horrible stuff that happens in that film is is actually accurate. But nevertheless, um, but one thing they do get right in that is they say tritium is really really rare, and there's only a few sort of kilos or so on on Earth. They're pretty accurate with that. Basically, there aren't very many um, natural processes that actually produce it. It's sort of produced by cosmic rays hitting hydrogen in the upper atmosphere, all that sort of stuff. But it's also radioactive. So uh, with a half life of about 12 and a half years. Mm. So if you get some 12 and a half years, you got, got half of it. And because there aren't really any processes that produce it, it's very rare. Um, but the good news is that you can actually produce it. Um, if you bombard lithium with high energy neutrons, um, which the fusion reaction with, between deuterium and tritium actually creates a high energy neutron. If you bombard lithium with it, the lithium can fission into tritium oh nice and so what you can do is you can breed the tritium that you need from lithium 
by using the neutron that comes out of the reaction. Um, <laughs> and the really clever thing is the neutron that comes out of the reaction is actually the bit that carries all the energy as well. Mm. So as the neutron hits the lithium, breeding some tritium, the lithium heats up from the kinetic energy of the neutron. And the heating up of that lithium is also what you can use to um, produce, you know, high, high energy and heat and therefore steam and turbines and all that sort of stuff. So you can sort of get a dual factor from that breeding where you're nice. breeding your fuel and you're getting your energy out at the same time. Cool. So we've got a very, very clean in terms of CO2 again and, and radioactivity, vast amounts of fuel, maybe with some prep required, but the amount of energy we're going to get back at the end is still going to be mm. worth it. <clears throat> Quite worth safe. That. Yeah, Sorry, exactly. For the, yeah. For the Please. Amount of fuel. Um, is that uh, if you're sort of getting fusion for uh, as, a, as a general fuel source, if you used the lithium in your laptop battery yep. and the deuterium that you'd find in a bathtub full of seawater, <laughs> that's about 35 years worth of electricity for a single person living in a Western sort of uh, level of, of um, energy usage. So it's, it's pretty substantial the amount of energy you get out of it. Amazing. It just shows the, the massive energy con concentration at those sort of nuclear levels. Um, so how do the latest machines work? So we, we, we sort of mentioned ITER a little bit, which is a, in many ways a sort of scaled up version of, of JET where, where you work. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And we talked about some of the issues that need to be overcome. So we need high temperatures, high pressures to get this thing going. What, what is the sort of experimental setup that we we go with at the moment to get that to get that fusion reaction going and to get over that sort of um, electrostatic um, force barrier, if we put it that way? Yeah. So um, so what we start off with effectively is is a vacuum chamber. So as I said, we need very very little of this fuel. Um, so you can't start with a whole load of air in there. So we have a, a rather large vacuum chamber. Yeah. Um, and the key is to use uh, magnetic fields to keep everything confined. Um, as you can imagine, if you're sort of heating something up very substantially, and then the particles of that are bouncing and hitting the walls, they're immediately losing all of their energy to yeah. the thousand tons of steel or whatever. Yeah. So one of the advantages that one of the things that happens to matter as it gets hotter and hotter, as you go past solid, liquid and gas, if you keep adding more energy, you get to another state of matter, which is called plasma. And basically what happens when you get to a plasma is that the nuclei and the electrons inside your matter have so much kinetic energy that the electrostatic attraction of those two is basically overcome. And so you end up with a soup of uh, positively charged and neg negatively charged particles. And because they're moving independently, it becomes a whole, the whole thing becomes charged. Mm. So you can hold it in place with a nice big magnetic field. Mm. So we have what's called a, a torus shape. That's uh, part of the name of the, the joint European torus. It's a donut shape, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. And that's the shape of the magnetic field. Um, and you can sort of just get your particles whizzing around in that magnetic field and sort of slowly speeding them up, very much like a particle accelerator, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Except you've just got a much bigger volume of it. And then once they're at a decent temperature, you can uh, you can get your you know fusion reactions to actually happen from it. Um, heating it up uses some some quite clever tricks, um, which uh, I could get into. If, uh, if yeah, please. That's yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, um, so the first thing we do for heating it up um, is we actually use it a little bit like a like a wire. So your you know your bar heater at home or just any wire when you run a, an electric current through it. Um, that's how we get the machine started is we run a huge electric current through the uh, through the gas that we just inject mm. into the chamber. And because we run, you know, it, it's it's about three or four million amps through it. Um, you can get some pretty decent temperatures just by ohmic heating for that, you know, 30, 30 or so million degrees. Mm. Um, you can get to just by using that. But as it gets hotter and hotter, it becomes more and more ionized, we call it, where the, the, the uh, positively charged and negatively charged bits uh, come out, and it actually conducts the electricity better, and so the resistance goes down and yeah. it can't be heated up so yeah. much. Yeah. Um, the other two major, major methods that we use to heat it up are wave heating, um, which is a bit like your microwave at home. You inject some electromagnetic waves into it, you sort of they ride the wave almost. You, you, you make sure the frequency of the wave is such that it pushes the particles around. 
and so you can you can keep them speeding up that way and again that increases the temperature and then the final method we use is called neutral beam injection um, which is a bit analogous to a, a cappuccino maker <laughs> where you're add what you're doing is you're literally firing in a small amount of very high energy particles so you create a particle beam like a, again like a particle accelerator and you just fire those particles into the plasma and they collide with the, the particles you've got already in there and it will impart their kinetic energy into it um, and the same way as i say with a with a cappuccino machine you've got small amounts of particles in your steam yeah. that give the uh, give the energy to your milk but it's a little bit analogous again in that you also end up with a little bit of froth. It can uh, it can make the plasma a bit messy, so uh, you need to deal with it becoming a little bit tricky. Amazing! Uh, but once you pull those in, you can you can get to some pretty pretty serious temperatures. Awesome! So that's the way that the 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 the, uh, the jet and sort of I to go about doing things. There's also a lot of governments and private companies working on some very odd sort of innovative approaches as well, aren't there? So. I was looking at the the, the sort of BBC um, article on this when it was talking about ITER, and they were talking about all of these little companies that are working on their individual ways of getting fusion to work. So there's this first light company which are using shock waves to crush fuel, briefly produce plasma. We've got Commonwealth Fusion Systems, which are running a, a sort of tokamak as well. Thai Technologies, the US Navy. What? What sort of different ways are they using to get to get fusion going, or are they all sort of along a very similar line? Uh, so I I don't know a huge amount about a lot of the, the okay. different ones, um, but in general there are two kind of main ways that that you can get fusion to sort of sustain, mm. um, and they're referred to as inertial confinement and magnetic confinement. And the basic principle is that you need three major things to get a fusion reactor going and that's temperature density and what we call confinement time which is basically how long you've got those conditions for yeah um and you can build there are lots of different types of machines that use uh magnetic confinement so the tokamak the, the, the torus that we're talking about mm. is exactly that it, it and it focuses on getting something really hot not being very dense but keeping it that way for a long time. So yeah. that's what we've, we've talked about with jet. Um, so I'm, imag I'm imagining if the density is low, that means less reaction sort of per unit time, but then you keep it there for longer. That means more reaction. So it's a trade off between the density and the amount of time you can keep it in those states as to exactly. the amount of energy you get. Yeah. And it's, of course, the more dense you have the, your plasma, um, the harder it is to just keep it there yeah. for mostly engineering reasons more than more than pure physics reasons. Things get really hot. The magnets that you need to confine everything get bigger and the current requirements yeah. get bigger yeah. and all these sort of things. So it is a bit of a trade off, as you say. Yeah. Um, and the idea is that the really high temperatures sort of compensate a bit. Yeah. Um, so as I said, it's 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. But then the center of the sun is yeah. it, like 100 times denser than yeah. lead or something. Yeah. Like that. yeah. So yeah. Again, it's this sort of trade-off. Yeah. Um, the other kind, inertial confinement, which by the sounds of things, a number of these other ones are, is where you're sort of more focused on temperature and density for a much shorter time. So uh, the one I'm more familiar with is something called the uh, a laser laser confinement fusion. Um, the National Ignition Facility, I think it's called in, in the United States. Mm. Um, basically, they have uh, they they put a tiny sort of pellet that's about a millimeter or so wide of solid deuterium tritium fuel in the center of a rather big vacuum chamber, and they fire 196 of the world's sort of most powerful lasers at it. <laughs> and it implodes, and the shock waves in such a way give you so much density and temperature that you can get sort of fusion happening in those in those conditions. Um, the so when it comes to sort of magnetic confinement machines, things like the tokamak, because it's a steady state kind of machine, yeah. you do have the advantage that you can sort of see how it, it has an easier transition to being a sort of power yeah. plant. Yeah. Um, it's so ra so rather than with these shock waves, that would be a, a sort of one shot deal, get a big, vast amount of energy out. But then in terms of uh, using it as, as, as a, a national power supply, you wouldn't be able to store that energy. It would be it would be less useful as a, as a, as an on grid solution, as it were. 
I, I mean, possibly. Uh, this is the thing about uh, the fusion technology is that there's a lot of different um, there's a lot of different research going on, and all of the research tends to sort of feed into one another. Um, now, the you know projects that get moved into the future, so things like ITER and then demonstration power plants like Demo or or Step and things like that, um, are on the cards. Um, but all of the kind of work that gets done at other tokamaks across the world or even at other fusion facilities like um, inertial confinement facilities and things, the kinds of discoveries that you get, the understanding of how the plasmas behave, how fusion conditions work, all sort of feed into one another. Um, and you do get a lot of cross collaboration in that respect. Yeah. So how far all of these other sort of private ventures and, and things are from something more advanced, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But in general, it's the, the scaling up is the difficult bit. Yeah. Um, get, getting some fusion to happen is, you know, uh, the kind of thing that I think there was a 14 year old, might even have been a 10 year old recently, who, <laughs> who built a fusor in his bedroom um it's very very impressive don't get me wrong for a for someone to, to be doing that <laughs> but it, it's not the kind of thing that immediately just oh okay well he's done it in his bedroom so now we can scale it up to a, a power plant there's yeah. there's some difficulty involved there so so you talked about that and i just i just want to understand where we are sort of moving towards that because obviously people are saying these are potential benefits of fusion um i think the uk government has recently announced an investment of 200 million to deliver electricity from a fusion reactor by 2040 we've got a lot of private companies working on this you've got Emmanuel Macron saying that this is a very important thing that will bring the common good of the world together and all these sorts of mm. nice sounding things but we have these these huge hurdles to overcome what what are the the biggest hurdles to going from something like ITER to getting this on the grid and using this for this this sort of beautiful nice clean energy future that we all want is it is it maintaining that reaction just on on an ongoing basis is it what are the big what are the big hurdles from going from where we are now to that because i my understanding at the moment is that as even though we can get this fusion going we we haven't managed to get a net positive energy out of these machines how, how are we going to get to that to that status Okay, so a few a few things to unpack, and I'll, I'll and, and I know I know that was a very sort of wide ranging question, so I'll give you I'll give you plenty of time to uh, to, if to I dive go into that. Off on tangents, do do grab me. No, on that's fine. Time. That's fine. Um, but yeah, so the in terms of the the general, you first sort of mentioned what sort of roadmaps and things. So um, in terms of an, an international effort, as you've said, you've mentioned ITER, which is something that's being built by a, a big sort of international collaboration. And it really is the sort of the world's largest fusion experiment. Mm. Um, it is worth mentioning it's still an experiment. It will be. Um, it, it's we're still understanding how it will all work properly in order to best design a power plant. Um, you mentioned that uh, the UK is putting sort of 200 million into uh, that's actually into the design of uh, something called STEP, which okay. is the spherical tokamak for energy production, which is something that UK AEA is, is sort of uh, spearheading. Um, and that is a it's a slightly different uh, what's called aspect ratio tokamak, but it's still a it's still basically a tokamak yeah. that will be designed to be looking at putting energy onto the grid by sort of 2040. And then the other thing that's that's quite common is or quite large is called demo, which is the demonstration power plant, which is due to be built sort of after ITER ITER's preliminary results. Okay. Um, so those are the sort of the, the large scale things that are going on. Um, in terms of what are the kinds of challenges, what, what are we looking at? Um, so a lot of the challenges are, in essence, a kind of a kind of an engineering challenge in that we want to we want to figure out, you know, we can do this in the lab. We yeah. can we can do fusion on a very basic level. We sort of have a, a, a good understanding of the physics, but turning that into something where there's a machine that will run for 24 hours a day yeah. and it will be subjected to very high heat loads yeah. it will be subjected to lots of neutrons bombarding it which will cause material issues um, 
And then uh, the the blanket that I talked about, the sort of the lithium where you breed your fuel and actually get energy out, that's not something that we will put on. You know, Jet doesn't have that because it's an ex- it's a lab experiment. Yeah. We're not yeah. we're not trying to get power out of it. Eater will have the the capacity to test different designs okay. for that kind of, uh, of thing. Uh, sorry, I think I didn't didn't mention that it's called a blanket before. Basically, it will be blanketing the inner wall of the machine. Mm. Which it's referred to in that way so eater will start making those some of those steps towards getting over the engineering challenges or at least addressing some of the engineering challenges that that will be needed for more stable energy production exactly it's worth mentioning though that it's not the end it's not just an engineering challenge in that it's not just engineers involved in this understanding the physics of how the reaction works and how a plasma behaves means that we can more easily manipulate it to make these kinds of things easier so if you can manipulate that plasma so that those heat loads for example are distributed over a larger area that changes the engineering engineering. problem that needs to be dealt with yeah yeah exactly and the final thing you you talked about a little bit was sort of um sustaining the reaction yeah um so uh, there have been small tokamaks um, around the world that use less plasma and thus have sort of fewer heat load problems that have sustained plasmas for days yeah. so it's the kind of thing that can be done over a long period but again you have issues with sort of things like keeping energy for your magnets going yeah. um for example jet has copper electromagnets so we're limited to how long we can run a, a a single experiment for because the copper electromagnets get too hot yeah and yeah. so uh, so ETA will have superconducting magnets, which removes that as a as an issue, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I believe, you know, experiments in ETA are due to be on the order of minutes to keep things going. And then the idea for something like demo would be to run for sort of hours at a time yeah. to keep things going. Um, in terms of the the sort of as you said, the power in power out thing, also a good point. Um, <laughs> it's so. The first thing to mention with with power in power out for fusion is that you will regularly see things like uh, jet has achieved a 0.6 or 0.66 ratio of power in to power yeah, out yeah um the first thing to mention on that is that that is a that's basically a science measurement so that's not how much energy we took from the grid to how much energy we would theoretically have put back onto the grid from electricity that oh is that's what i thought it, that's what i read it as that's exactly what i read it as no it, it's a very good point and and you know we don't want to mislead people it's a it's a physics measurement so that's how much power we managed to actually put into our fuel right. versus how much fusion fusion energy was created right. in that process and obviously converting that into electricity is not something that's going to be 100% ah, okay efficient. so there's going to be an efficiency there as well on top of that so okay. there is but the thing about building larger machines with fusion is that's where you get your big gains mm. because you're trying to keep something hot and dense for a long time And that's much, much easier if it's larger. Um, It's not quite the same sort of thing. um, But if you can imagine, you know, a bathtub full of hot water will cool down or a swimming pool even cool down a lot slower than your mug of hot tea does. And it's a surface area to volume ratio sort of thing, as well as there are other processes that allow us to sort of keep the plasma hot as you get it bigger it sort of heats itself yeah um, the helium that comes out actually has a little bit of energy and it can heat itself up a bit and so as you build it bigger and bigger you get you can start to get to the point where you get much more energy out than you're putting in yeah um and that's in in terms of you know just the reaction um, once you're at the point where you're just sort of leaving leaving magnets on and just letting the plasma get on with it yeah. and just chucking a little bit of fuel into it you can you can reap an awful lot more energy yeah. off it whereas with jet we have to put in so much power just to keep it hot because it's so small so, so even though we've been we're told in the media look oh we're getting less energy out than we're putting in a lot of it has been because we haven't been attempting to do that we've been attempting to understand the plasma understand the the technologies, how this thing behaves, the engineering challenges going forward. And we haven't yet actually addressed necessarily, or at least fully, those steps towards going from uh, a physics experiment to, you know, uh, a delivering power source that could be put onto the grid. So it's, it's perhaps a little bit unfair to say that 
that we just it, it wouldn't work essentially because you've never demonstrated yeah. more power coming out. We we haven't addressed the addressed that side of things yet fully. No, you're you're completely right. That's a really good way to look at it. Um, just thinking of analogies off the top of my head, um, it's like only ever having access to you know a hundred meters to run in yeah and you spend all your time yeah. learning how yeah. to run and yeah. making sure you know what to do and then they say run and a marathon say, and you're like uh, yeah and what? then you yeah. say well you've to run a marathon it's like no but we we sort of yeah. get the point here yeah. and, and we, we understand you... what putting one foot in front of the other is and trying to go as fast as possible we just need to we need to put it into that specific context of uh of what we're trying to achieve yeah. And once you once you start scaling up from, you know, you know, once you get really, really good at running, you can you can sort of uh, sort of <laughs> you can then say, OK, not... I'm not going to run quite as fast, but I'm going to I'm going to go a bit slower and get further. Yeah. You can apply it to the specific exactly. yeah. situation. Although trying to convert a sprinter into a marathon runner is probably not the best. <laughs> no, it's not a perfect analogy, but we, I think we understand where we were going with that. That was, it was good enough. So I guess as we as we sort of come to the end of this, that was. That was really nice in understanding sort of the challenges going forward. And and maybe this is quite a speculative question, but what what role do you think fusion will play in the future energy mix, particularly as we we sort of view it few, through the prism of climate change? Because there's, there's some people who are like, you know, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. Fusion will come along. You know, technology always sorts things out. In 20, 30 years, we'll have these fusion reactors and, and nobody will care and everything will carry on as as before um you know there's other people who are saying no you know this won't be ready you know the price of wind and solar is continuing to drop so we should just just use those things what what how do you think fusion's going to feed into the energy mix in in sort of the next 10 20 30 years i know that's quite a speculative question with the barriers to be overcome but but where where would you see it and obviously you've got skin in the game as well but <laughs> well, I mean, to a certain extent, in that in that it's something I really I really care about. It's it's not something that's gonna sort of uh, you know it, it's something that I would like to see happen, and I think is is going to be very useful. Ten, twenty, thirty years is one of those very short timescales where it's hard to see fusion having a huge impact unless funding were to increase dramatically in a way that I, I don't think is likely to happen. Um, it's one of those difficult of... trade-offs, isn't it? Because people are saying, look, we need to do something on climate change. And, you know, obviously we do. And you could throw all your eggs in one basket and go, right, we're going to put all our money into fusion and hope it works. But then if it doesn't, you, you're kind of lost. Whereas if you throw it into wind and solar, you're going to get some known benefit out, even if it's not, you know, potentially the magic bullet that fusion could be. So it's, it becomes a difficult mm. political question as as well, obviously. Yeah. I mean, it's it's certainly true um, in terms of that. I mean, in terms of things like, uh, you know, budgets for science funding and stuff, you are it, the, the comparison of that versus sort of, you know, what oil exploration um, costs are is they're in very, very different ballparks. Mm. Um, and so, you know, if you are comparing it against, you know, should we put money into solar and, and wind and things, maybe there's there's questions about how much you want to do. But yeah. um, in terms of that budget growing overall, I would be very pleased to see that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but in terms of a fusion energy mix, um, as I said at the start, it's, it's sort of where you see um, the issue of having renewables that aren't sort of 100% reliable all the time, yeah. as well as high, high sort of land use and issues yeah. of, you know, the amount of material you need to use to create large amounts of solar yeah. panels yeah. or large amounts of, of wind turbines, all that sort of stuff. You're quarrying an awful lot of material. Yeah. Yeah. And so Fusion does have benefits in that, in that respect. Yeah. Um, as well as it being sort of a slightly different um, target in that, as I say, it's more or more of a sort of baseline supply, yeah. the kind of thing that you can keep running and you can turn on and you can you can control where these other sort of renewables are a little bit different in that respect. Yeah. And once you're talking, once you're out of fuel, uh, fossil fuels, for example, whether that be because you don't want to be putting any more CO2 in or because you've run out of them, um, and you reduce to sort of nuclear fission on its own, 
um, even then you've got a little bit of difficulty in in how much base load you can you can produce yeah. and so fusion sort of slotting in as a baseline seems like a, a much more logical thing yeah. um, now how it will happen over the next sort of few decades yeah um, it's very speculative I, it, it's very speculative um, I think you can probably safely say that within a decade, we're not going to be putting huge amounts of uh, fusion power onto the grid. Yeah. Um, but once you start looking at sort of the 2040s, 2050s, when you're looking at um, demonstration power plants coming onto the grid, um, the hope is that at that point, that sort of commercialization uh, becomes a viable thing to do with them. Once you've got something off the ground and you're saying, look, we can actually produce power from it. Yeah. It's clean, it's safe, all this sort of stuff you can actually get a, a big benefit from yeah. it yeah and, um, yeah there's there's lots of uh, lots of individual stuff that could come out after things like eater as well it's a it's a huge international experiment but the amount that we will learn from it may well allow multiple countries to sort of go their own way a little bit with with demonstration power plants um, much like sort of the kind of thing that happened with with fission although there were there were other reasons for that at the time as well <laughs> i think that's so Please, yeah, f please, go on. Uh, I was going to say it, it, it's it's one of the one of the things about working on the the fusion side is that you know you don't have don't have military funding, which is you know military funding is good in terms of being a lot, but also you know it's, uh, <laughs> it's exactly with that one. I think I think that's a really a really nice place to finish a very a, a sort of hopeful place. But if 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 I was to sum that up of that section. I'd say this is potentially very useful, potentially can give us that base load in 20, 30 years. Hopefully it'll be this amazing, clean, um, you know, producer of energy. But people probably shouldn't hang their hat on it in the next sort of 20, 30 years to be this magic bullet that will, will solve everything to do with climate change, particularly because we're probably not going to throw all our money out in a, just in a political sense. And even mm. if we did, there's still challenges that need to be overcome. So in the short to medium term, it's going to be part of a mix, if anything. And then hopefully when we're talking sort of 50, 60 years in the future, it'll be, you know, we drive down the road and everywhere's got a little, a little Mr. Fusion to power everything, but that's still a little bit of a, of a way off. Is that fair? I, I think it's still, it's probably still worth mentioning. I think even in the, the sort of longer term, it's likely to be part of a mix mm. of, of energy sources. I mean, if you, if you have to have these enormous, uh, power plants that that you have to turn on and off all the time yeah. um, it's a good idea to get as much as much as you can from things like wind and solar yeah. and so they will form a decent part of the mix it's it's more that it fits into a yeah. nice mix like that in the future but yeah on the on the scale of sort of 20 years you're still looking at at the most sort of demonstration yeah. plants that'll give you some power and then hopefully soon after that you would see um, you would see sort of more things popping up in terms of commercialized versions. Superb. Anthony, thank you so much for, for going through that all with me. I understand the roadmap and, and what's uh, and what's going on much better and the technology as well. And I think everyone out there will, will say the same. Thank you again so much. Um, where can people go to find out more about, well, what you're saying about it, what ETA is saying about it, what the UK... Uh, UK Energy uh, Atomic Energy Authority are saying what where would you like to guide people to find out more about these these topics and, and get engaged well i'm going to uh, firstly i will definitely make sure i send you some some links from Please our do. communication department Please. um i'm sure the the standards are going to uh, ccfe.ac.uk which is the the one for for column and ukaea.org.uk um, are the sort of areas for my uh, my organization um, outside of that there's always sort of facebook twitter from ukaea official um and then outside of that i mean there's an awful lot of information on things like um the eta organization as well um where you can go and you can see uh, some pretty interesting photos of it all being built actually i think they've got some uh, live videos uh, of nice. what the construction sites all look like as well so Superb. that would be where to go send those over to me i'll put them all down in the description along with your your personal links as well again anthony thank you so much for taking the time really really interesting really really fascinating and i hope to see the the progress of this over the the sort of coming years and and maybe when something exciting in the in the sphere happens again we'll have you back and we'll we'll discuss it again
That would be lovely. I, I can tell you there's some interesting stuff happening in the next year or so, actually, when we're uh, running jet with some high power fuel mixes. So that's going to be uh, very, very interesting. Awesome. Uh, I, I want to hear about it and, uh, and maybe we'll we'll have a chat about it. I'm sure the, the news will butcher it and say that, you know, we're all saved or we're all going to be blown <laughs> up. So we'll we'll get you on to explain what what the actual uh, what, what actually is going on on the ground. Super. I'm awesome. sure they'll do a good job. <laughs> Oh, and worth plugging actually is if you have uh, direct questions, um, our communications department are going to hate me for this, but uh, communications at ukaea.uk, send them send them the questions and you can tell them I sent you. To be so fair, they were me. very good with me. They put me they put me through to you, so I'm not, I'm not having a bad word said about them. So awesome, Wonderful. head Thank over there, so much, put them under pressure, ask your questions. And again, all the links are down below. Anthony, thank you so much again. And uh, I'll talk to you soon, buddy. Thank you for having me, Sam. It's been lovely to talk to you. A pleasure. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.